All right, here with my very good friend, Jack Hibbs. And it's been an incredible experience so far here at the Pastors Summit. And I, I know you've been to a lot of conferences yeah. throughout your career, but something like this, it just feels like there's, there's a shift. Yep. And obviously being in a place like Southern California where pastors like you stood up to tyranny. What's it been like talking to these other pastors and what do you think you want to take away from yeah. this week? Yeah, it's been incredible. Uh, well said, number one, being in Southern California, this is the last place that people would think about there'd be a pastor's conference. Number two, the fact that TPUSA Faith is hosting this is I think part of what makes it very special because we've got pastors here from every walk of life. Normally, you wouldn't get a pastor's diversity like this under one roof. Normally they're denominational or movement based, yep. but because of Turning Point's reach and exposure, there's guys here from every possible denomination. So why is that important? Because they're hearing about how to take on the culture while at the same time preaching the gospel. And so we should be, as pastors, always faithful to preach the gospel, but as pastors we are also commanded to make disciples. And so what they're hearing at this great conference is from experts who come from their wheelhouse of how to deal and how to address the culture from a biblical worldview. So this is golden. I mean, I would expect this conference to do nothing but grow. And then what do you think it's going to look like for years to come? Because like, this is just the start of something great. And especially if you're able to get people in this setting together to have conversations, because a lot of times you just you're looking for an outlet to talk about something, but you got your own congregation and the way you go about things might be a little bit different to them. And mm -hmm. theologically, you might look at things things mm -hmm. different. Like, right. where do you see this molding into? John, this is something that the church, if, if the church is going to uh, succeed in this day and age, and it will, Jesus promised it will, we've got to be able to be secure enough in our own theology, right, that we can get together with other brothers that uh, they might wear a robe in the pulpit. I don't. Mm -hmm. But they're willing to get together and talk about how do we advance truth? How do we, how do we advance the gospel? How do we advance a, a culture that will save our children? So what I see for the future, I know this sounds crazy, but as dark and as evil as things are, and we hear about it constantly, I think it's actually a trumpet call for mm -hmm. pastors to stand up. I think God is using the darkness to send a message to us, hey pastors, stand up, this is your moment, go for it. Mm -hmm. You've got the light, you've got the truth, and I'm actually, I'm not a big fan, I'm an old guy, John, so I'm not a big fan of modern terminologies, but people wanna talk about community, community, community. Mm -hmm. Well, how about community around truth mm -hmm. that's doing righteousness? I love that because, well, we're a group of guys that do this or a group of guys that do the other. Hey, how about this? How about a community that encourages one another based upon the fact that we're standing in truth and we have agreed to let our, sh our light shine in the cultures that God placed us in? So with that, there can be this connection of pastors nationwide that say, hey, I just, I just got a letter from the mayor's office saying that we, we can't have our prayer meeting um, you know, uh, out in the city park. Well, the law says you can. And so this is the guy you need to talk to. And the, the, and this is the attorneys that will uh, make that letter clear to your city. You see, that sounds something like, Jack, that's such a little deal. It's not a little deal, it's a big deal. When you have that kind of connection where, hey, that brother had a network of answers for me that wound up benefiting our congregation and it's turned out to be beautiful. God honors that. Mm -hmm. And then I think there's times where there might, there's that sound, that trumpet call, and God calling you to take action. Yeah. How do you expect and encourage people to hear that call? Because sometimes I feel like, especially in our world right now, it seems like a lot of people's hearts are hardened mm -hmm. and their, their eyes might be closed and their ears might be closed yeah. to that. So like, how, how do people open up their hearts a little bit more to that call and then take action yeah. once hearing that? Uh, I would say look around, look around. What I, what, by that I mean this, in every generation, God has, will provide a leader or leaders. Mm -hmm. Look around with your Bible open and see who is biblically sound and culturally aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Is God's hand upon that ministry or that individual? 
I want to learn from them. I want to know. Because I'm a firm believer that we love our Bibles for many reasons, but one of them is the underdog always wins with God. Why is that? Because when the moments look impossible, God raises up a leader. And you think about the leadership that God did with this, such an unusual individual as Winston Churchill. I mean, the guy actually saved the world, Winston Churchill. Mm -hmm. And everybody was against him and everybody hated him, but the dude was on Truth's side. And now he's obviously a legend. What happened? When someone stands, there's something within our human spirit that we experience uh, encouragement. We're emboldened by someone else's courage. When someone says, we're going to take a stand on this issue of, of truth, people will rally to that, John. And that's what needs to happen in America today. I, I don't want to, I don't want to put a, a damper on anything when I say, I'm, I'm involved, you're involved, we're all engaged, we're engaged, but I do not believe the answer is going to come from Sacramento. And I don't think the answer is coming from Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. I think God has built life to where the answer is supposed to come from his pulpits. Mm -hmm. American history is a story about pulpits affecting the governance of man. Mm -hmm. Benjamin Franklin made that incredibly clear as John Adams did. It's awesome. So why are we elevating the ballot box more than the <laughs> pulpit then? Because it's, I mean, obviously we, great want, question. we, we want people um, in positions of power, yeah. whether it's locally or we, you know, right? federally, to be you know, pro-life, on our side for freedom. We're commanded on, to do yeah. that. But it seems like there, there's a lot of people that feel like, well, you know, why can't we just start the ballot box here and then we'll hopefully yeah. the, that'll turn them to faith. But it's just, it yeah. seems like it's all flipped upside down. Right You're now. exactly correct. And we need to flip it right side up, which is this. In Proverbs 29, the Bible says that when the wicked are in power, the people groan. Mm -hmm. But when the righteous are in authority, the people rejoice, right? Yep. The scriptures warn us over and over again to pray for our leaders, that they might be good leaders who do good, that we might live peaceable lives. For us to get involved in the culture and with those who make the decisions for our children and our children's children, some will say that's politics. And what I say back is, wait a minute, who invented government? God did. Politics is man's prostitution of government. Mm -hmm. Politics is when man pimps government. The believer is the one that should be the custodian, the steward of good government, right? Mm -hmm. John Jay, the Chief Justice of the United States, first one said, it's wise for the nation to elect to themselves Christians. Mm -hmm. Think of that statement, yep. why? Because the whole assumption is that Christians know the Bible, they understand how man operates and that God is king and that uh, we have a republic whereby it's we the people. Mm -hmm. And sadly today, pulpits are either ignorant. Well, I mean, we could fix ignorance. Yeah. We can teach them. I hope it's not that they've abandoned their post. I, I pray to God that that's not the case. How do you encourage other pastors that have been faithful like you? And obviously it's turned into plenty of people flocking to your church, but that turns into more social media followers. That turns into maybe new and bigger buildings. That turns into bigger tides. Oh yeah. Um, how do you make sure that they are still rooted and how do you stay rooted your, yourself? Because obviously you are called to be a steward of, right. of what you're blessed with, but That's exactly obviously right. there's gotta be times where you need to have accountability groups and you need to figure out, you know, if God's given us this, how do we steward this in the best way? Um, the only correction I would make, John, with what you, you said, you said that there, there needs to be times of accountability. I would always. edit that and say, exactly. <laughs> always. <laughs> I would That's edit, why we need this guy. <laughs> I would edit that and say, always. Yeah. Be very open, very transparent. Your church leadership style yeah. should be your door, your office is open. Mm -hmm. You should know your staff and you should know your congregation. After every service, you should be out there with them in the foyer or in the courtyard or parking mm -hmm. lot welcoming them in and, and saying goodbye to them when they leave. Why? Because this is awesome. So we have an extremely large church. Uh, our community is rather small. It's interesting. So wherever Lisa and I go, uh, people who are for us or against us, it's irrelevant. They know who we are and they connect with us. 
hey, Pastor, I don't think you're right about this or that. Hey, you know what? Okay, thank you for sharing that. Or, hi, Pastor Jack, how are you? We need to be careful that we're not isolated in what we would wrongly call success. Big tithes doesn't mean big success. It means big, big stewardship responsibilities, and you need to bring more people in on how is this done rightly, okay? And that's true about everything else. From hiring your staff, I believe that your staff should be people that you find in prayer meetings. That's where I find my staff is in prayer meetings. And so it's just being open among the flock. Jesus was always with the flock. He was never hiding out. And I think that by nature, you never have to have an accountability group because everybody sees you. Everybody yeah. knows where we live. Mm -hmm. I mean, they literally know where we live. And so uh, just be like Jesus the best you can. That's what we strive to be is be like him. And I think people can appreciate that transparency too because I feel like so much now we, there's so many conversations about faith and government right now. And then government, it seems like there is no transparency whatsoever at right. all. It's like, here's a bill the yeah. size of the biggest Bible you could find. Right, right. <laughs> and it's like, you got 15 minutes to read it. It's a yes or no. And then it's just, you have disasters happening uh, in Afghanistan. So there's no accountability for that. We're exactly. in a recession right now. Or there's billions no being shipped in cash to an undisclosed location in the, you know, mm -hmm. Afghan desert or whatever. Things yeah. were rogue. I mean, right now, if I approach this moment from a biblical worldview, which I must, mm -hmm. Our government is running roughshod across the Constitution, mm. Americans, and the world for that matter. This is the United States, the most powerful entity on the planet, but we have forgotten God. Mm. And unless there's a turn in the pulpits, God, look, we're coasting right now. And you and I, what the viewers don't know is on the other side of this uh, background right here is paradise, right? There's, Very palm, nice. <laughs> there's palm trees, there's blue ocean, yeah. it's incredible. These are blessings. I don't know how long we're gonna have them, John, mm -hmm. because how long will God stay around where he's not welcome? And what we need to do as pulpit, as pastors in the pulpit, is announce to our community, we're gonna obey God, we're gonna bless God. Mm -hmm. And maybe he'll give us mercy and prolong our days, but that's gotta happen. It's not gonna be a political messiah. It's something I know we've talked about, uh, we just talked about at lunch, uh, not on camera, now we can talk about it on camera, yeah. is this idea that just almost feels like in America we feel like we're owed. Oh and my And I know I can, I can even fall into that a little bit too, like I don't feel like I really understand what persecution really looks like yeah. as a Christian. Yeah. And, sure. um, and I think there's obviously a lot of pastors that had a very courageous stand like you but it seems like right now there's almost like an American privilege mm -hmm. um, that we expect, you know, God, right. like we've been the freest country and the most prosperous nation in the history of the entire world. This is bad right now, but you'll eventually take care of us, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna get better, right? I mean, I mean, we might get a, a little bit more gas prices, but it's gonna get better, right? Mm -hmm. No, people need to realize that uh, Jesus is not an American. He doesn't surf here in San Diego. Uh, Jesus, the 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 god of the bible uh he owes us nothing mm -hmm. in fact if, in fact with what jesus said to whom much is given much is required mm -hmm. so think about that that's te that's terrorizing if you think about it. we've been blessed as you said beyond so jesus the scriptures the bible teaches to whom much is given much is required we need to repent of our entitlement mm -hmm. and i'm not talking black white and every color in between I'm talking about the idea that, well, well nothing bad's really going to happen to America, right? Because, like, God's, God's got us, right? Listen, we are not going to escape what every nation goes through. Eventually, our faith's going to be tested. And he's been very gracious to us. Yeah. But the testing, I believe the testing has begun publicly. I believe COVID was part of that. Mm -hmm. I believe the current dynamic of gen the gender identity is a big one. And I believe the pro-life issue. All of this is almost like a winnowing of wheat from the chaff. And you see it most exposed or most revealed in the pulpit. Go to any church and listen. Go for four weeks and listen. What, does, what's, what are you getting from that ministry teaching? Is it five steps on how to be successful? Or is it, this is what the Bible says about sin, righteousness, heaven, hell, joy, 
death, mm -hmm. life, right? So. And the final question then would be, how do you encourage other pastors to prepare and then to prepare their congregation? Because it seems like from what you're saying, which I think you could be totally spot on about, is we, we might look at the pandemic and that's just a blip on the radar. Absolutely. There, there could be so much more to come. And if Absolutely. we think that that was the major battle nope. and we just made it through and here, here we go. Yep. We're, just, we're gonna be coasting from here on out. How do you prepare pastors? How do you prepare congregations? I would start with how God prepared Jeremiah. Jeremiah, you have walked with the footmen and you've become weary? You can hear God's tone. Jeremiah, you're tired? You've walked with the footmen and you're pooped out? What are you going to do when the Jordan begins to overflow and the chariots arrive? That's the word that I would say, Pastor, is that not in the Bible? Yes. What do you think it means? I'd want them to tell me. And then I would want to encourage them, listen. COVID and its dynamics, I'm talking, I'm not talking about the sickness, I'm talking about yeah. the politics of it, mm -hmm. was preparatory for what's next. So get ready. Don't be fearful. Yeah. You need courage. Joshua chapter one, be strong of good courage. The Lord thy God, I'm with you wherever you go. So get ready for the next thing. You don't need to be panicking about it. Just get ready for the next thing. And as you're ready, your congregants will follow your lead as you follow Jesus. And where do we get that from? Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Yeah. And that's the model. We're simply copying what was given. And then I hope they take a story like yours and a career like yours and so many other people that are here at the Pastor Summit to know this isn't the first time that you've had to really prepare for an all out assault. Yeah. Like when you're starting out in your career, you're like you've received a lot of yeah. hate, a lot of pushback. True. So it seemed like hey, let's figure out this thing here, a couple weeks. All right, that's not what we thought it yeah. was. We're moving forward and I know how to move forward because I've been hit before that's and you right. can keep hitting me again, <laughs> but I got somebody on my side that you're never gonna defeat. Uh, my, the, the, great, the great philosopher, Mike Tyson, <laughs> said, uh, when asked, what are you gonna do? What's your next strategy uh, regarding this next fight? And he said, everybody's got a plan until they get hit in the face. And his answer was simply this. If you have a biblically based plan that is second nature to you as a pastor, right? Then when the events of life punch you in the face, you can take it. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna get knocked off point because you have been on point and there's, like Peter said, Lord, where else do we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Mm -hmm. So what happens now, I know this is gonna sound crazy, John, but because I've watched God bring us through battles and, vi and those victories, the next situation, I don't know what it is. I, do, I just know this. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be a white knuckle ride. It's going to force me to draw closer to Jesus. And he knows the outcome. And I want to be with him on his outcome. Mm -hmm. Not my outcome, his outcome. Amen. So I'm excited about what's next, whatever it is. And then maybe next year we should try to get Mike Tyson to come here. Tell us how we Mike can take Tyson, some hits. <laughs> Mike Tyson needs to be here. Amen to that. But really, really thankful for you. I'm so glad you're a part of TPUSA Faith. Love it. I think a lot of people here look up to you, and I definitely look up to you myself, so I appreciate the well, time. Well, John, thank you so much for that. I love being with you. Thank you. God bless you.